Man, this week we're going to be, this is, this, we're in the book of James and we're in week eight of a series and today we're going to finish the series because the book of James is only five chapters and we're on chapter five and so we'll jump into a brand new series next week entitled Thriving in Babylon. But uh, we've been going through the book of James. The book of James is a very practical book. Okay, we've been looking at things like uh, how to tame our tongue, how to be not only hearers but doers of the word, finding God's will for our life, heavenly wisdom and earthly wisdom. We've been unpacking all of those. And man, the, the book of James is like the, the book of Proverbs for the New Testament. So in the Old Testament, the book of Proverbs is a wisdom book, right? You, you read it and you're like, wow, that was really wise. That was so good. I can apply that to my life. Well, the book of James in the New Testament is very similar, Right Where you, you read it and you go, man, that was so practical, that was so wise, that was so good. And, and the heart of this series is to be able to have faith in motion or making your faith work. And that's how we're going to end our series today with that, making your faith work. What does that look like? And so I want you to be able to go on a journey with me uh, as we've unpacked this book. It's been so practical, so life-giving. Hopefully it's maturing you in your faith along your journey but in James chapter 5, it seems like he starts with, with something that could be controversial, at least for today in our text, in verse 13. It's, it's like, James, you've been unpacking this. It's been really good. It's been really practical. And now all of a sudden, you're going to jump out with this in verse 13 through 16. Does this, does this make sense? Does it fit? Uh, because all of us have seen, all of us have heard, maybe some of us have watched videos online or been in some services where you're like, man, I've seen some things, I've heard some things. Uh, you know, I watched a dude wave his coat over people, and you're like, this is, this is a little creepy. Um, for a moment, I just want you to sit here, unpack this scripture, maybe with a fresh start. Because sometimes we come to church and we have a preconceived notion of this, oh, this is what we're talking about. This is where we're going today. Whew. Put all that off to the side for a moment and let this just be a fresh start and allow the scripture to speak to you because the truth is, is this is God's word and he wants us to, to be able to grow in our faith and go along in this journey this morning. So if you have your Bibles, let's look at James chapter 5 verses 13 through 16. It says, is anyone among you in trouble? Right? So that means there's going to be people around us today that are in trouble. There's going to be some type of issue that some of us may be facing. It says, let them what? Pray. And so you're going to see two things in our text today. You're going to, hear, you're going to see the word pray, and you're going to see the word faith. And so I wonder if God's trying to get our attention today to have faith and to pray through these moments. It says, is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. All right, that's worship. That's also a form of prayer, right? To be able to sing song of praise and thanksgiving for what God is going to do as you're asking him. It says, is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. All right, we anoint uh, people with oil here at Radiant Life Church. All right, if you ask for it when we have our prayer time, we would gladly anoint you with oil. Understand that uh, the oil is symbolic. Just like when we take communion, it is, is, it is not the actual representation. That's not the blood of Christ. So that's, not, that's not the body of Christ. We are, those are symbolic uh, gifts that we have in our hand that we, we take. Well, the oil is the same. The oil is symbolic to the presence of the Holy Spirit. Oil, okay, when you see it in, in, all throughout Scripture, it's his presence, right? That's the presence of the Holy Spirit. So it goes on, the text goes on to say, And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Again, there's that word. Pray for each other so that you may be healed. Now, understanding this word healed in the context of this scripture isn't just a physical healing. It's emotional. It's spiritual. This is a complete healing. And it says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And so when, when we think about healing, sometimes we have extremes, right? We have the name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. If I said it, I should have it. Okay, extreme, that is, that is way over here. And if you pray and God doesn't heal you, then God has a problem with you because you must have sin in your life. And so you have that side of the extreme, which can cause confusion, can cause shame, uh, can, can put up a, a defense system of I can't trust you, right? So you have this one extreme and along with that extreme sometimes comes what I would say is like the spooky kooky. Right, And so you're like, maybe I don't want to be a part of that extreme. Well, then the pendulum swings, and it goes all the way over to this side. And on this side is healing. healings don't happen anymore. Miracles aren't possible anymore. When Jesus came, and he gave his life, and he died on the cross, and he ascended back to the Father, miracles ceased. 
So you have one extreme that says they don't exist, and one extreme says if you, if you don't receive it, then there's some type of sin in your life. You see, here at Radiant Life Church, what do we believe? What do I believe? I believe in divine healing. The church believes in divine healing. And so you may be here this morning, maybe watching on your line, you're like, okay, Pastor Lance, then, then here's my question. Then why doesn't God do it every time? Right? If you believe it, if the church believes it, if it's biblical, if it's scriptural, then why does God not heal every single time? I'm going to give you some wisdom, so I want you to write it down. You ready? This is going to be super wise for you this amount. It's going to be very profound. The answer to your question, you ready? I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why God does what he does, but what I do know is God always does the right thing. God always does the right thing. Our unanswered prayer is, is in our limited moments of now, right? We see in the now. Like, what am I experiencing now? Did I get my coffee now? Is, is, um, am I waiting too long in a line for my fast food? We only see in the now. God operates in a completely different realm than what we do. And so often, we, we're stuck right here on earth, and God is in heaven, and God's like, listen, I, I answer and I move on earth, but sometimes my answer is heaven. Right? It's not in the now, it's in what is to be. Because ultimately, how many know that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time? Amen. Right? One, day you'll be, you, one day we'll be in a place where we'll be for, I don't know, millions, billions, trillions, eternity. And here on planet earth, we're lucky if we get to the eighty. Right? So we have 80 years or a trillion of years, so God is more focused on what is to come than what is right now. And there is a level of faith that all of us need to have to be able to trust God and to believe that he's doing the right thing on our behalf. He's doing the right thing on our behalf. And I don't know about you, but I'm good with not having all the answers sometimes. I'm good with not knowing. And, and you're like, well, is that, is that faith? Is that blind faith? Is that trust? Let me, let me explain it to you in, in this sense. Right now, Right now, the earth is spinning at a thousand miles an hour. Can you feel it? No, right? Everybody's still pretty good, right? It's spinning at a thousand miles an hour so that way it can rotate and we'll see the sun, the moon, right? And that will be one complete day. It's like 23 hours and 58 seconds, something like that, of, of how fast, like that's how fast we have to spin a thousand miles an hour to get a complete day. At the same time, while we're spinning a thousand miles an hour, we are rotating and moving around the sun to complete one year at 67,000 miles an hour. Do you feel that one? Right, just imagine, we're traveling at 67,000 miles an hour while spinning 1,000 miles an hour, yet we're perfectly either having a seat or standing. And we don't feel that because the gravitational pull is set in such a way that we can be able to walk and not feel the effects of how fast we're spinning or how fast we're rotating. That doesn't make sense to me. Like, how don't I feel that? What makes sense to me is, is that there's a God, there is a creator who says, listen, I got this whole thing in my hand. It's like he's spinning earth like a basketball and it's only moving at the right pace, at the right speed in order for us to experience life. Because what would happen is if earth began to slow down, everything, including the mountains, would shift to the east, we'd have tsunamis, earthquakes, and it would be complete devastation and destruction and earth would no longer exist. Yet here we are. I don't understand that. I don't need to understand it, to, under, to, to fully know and have faith that God truly has us exactly where he has us, and he has us in his hands. My question to, to you would be, do you want to follow a God who you can fully understand, or a God who is too big to grasp? Let that sink in. Like, do you want to follow a God who you go, oh, I can fully understand it. It totally makes sense. In my logical brain, everything God does makes sense. Or would you rather serve a God who's too big to grasp? There's, there's too much of him. It's too big. It's too grandeur. I would rather serve a God who you go, man, that doesn't make sense. That seems impossible, yet with God, all things are possible. It brings me comfort to know that, that I serve a God who is so big, yet so close. Right? If you've never had the opportunity to see it, I would encourage you to do it. Um, to Google later on today, not probably while I'm preaching, but maybe later on today. Uh, Google Louis Giglio, How Great Is Our God, Laminin. Just Google that and then watch that whole sermon, and then you will see how big God is and how small we are. And yet he's holding us all together with a cell adhesion molecule called laminin. And laminin inside our body right now is the glue that holds us together. And it looks like this. It's like he's saying, my life on the cross is what's going to hold your life together. 
right, that you can experience life, and I'm going to be the glue that will keep you on your faith journey. So will we have the faith and the trust in who he is? I found three observations from our text in James chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. Here's the first one, is that God still heals people. God still heals people. He does. There is no verse in scripture that says, that says miracles or healings will no longer happen. There isn't one. Now there's a verse that says, listen, when perfection comes, so the second coming of Christ, when he comes, perfection, like, like the gifts and all that will cease and you don't, you don't need the healings. Why? Because we're already with him and everything in heaven is perfect. We don't need the sun or the moon because all we'll need is his glory, according to the scripture. But here and now, there's no verse that says that. Actually, there's a verse that says in Hebrews 13, 8, it says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Right? So, the, so what happened 2,000 years ago could happen today. And what happened today could happen 2,000 years from now if he should tarry. Because he's not changing. And so that should give us a promise of he's going to be here. He's going to heal. He's going to move. And, and sometimes I think we take it for granted. We forget. Right? How many know the Israelites had... They, they had memories that lasted about this long, right? God provides this miracle and they walk through on dry ground and they're like, oh, this is great. And then all of a sudden they're hungry and he's like, don't you think I'm gonna take care of you? Here, here's manna from heaven. Okay, that's great. Now I'm gonna complain again and now I'm gonna give you water. And it's like complaint after complaint because there's short-term memory loss. I think sometimes we had the same thing. We forget. Like we forget that right here before our very eyes, just a few short months ago, my daughter got up here and shared a testimony of God's, prov God's provision and a healing within her body. She took a phone call from a doctor that said, hey, Brie, I know you are diagnosed with this. She has eight autoimmune diseases. One of them is called interstitial lung disease. I know you are diagnosed with this. I know that we see it in your charts. We've seen it on your x-rays. We've seen it on your CT scans. We can see the effects of it in the, in the PT chamber when you're doing your breathing. We know you have it. However, in your last scan, is gone. It's gone. It's not there. Here's the deal. There is no medicine. There is no injection. There is no cure. It is a death sentence. Yet in about a half hour, she'll stand up here and she'll belt out from her lungs a song of worship. Why? Because God has healed her of that disease miraculously, right? And so let's not forget who he is and what he does. And now I get, you're like, okay, Pastor Lance says, awesome, but, but you said she had eight, which means now she has seven. Why didn't he take all? How come it took such a long period? Maybe the verse that helped me could help you. 2 Timothy 4.18. It says, yes, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil attack and will bring me safely into his heavenly kingdom. All glory to God forever and ever. Amen. So Pastor Lance, which one is it? Is he going to deliver me from every evil attack or is he going to take me to heaven? The answer is yes, both. Because if he delivers you, that's the miracle. If he takes you to heaven, that's the miracle. You're receiving the healing, you're receiving the blessing, you're receiving his goodness and his answer either way. And so healing is still possible today. But then all of a sudden in, in James here in chapter five, right, he's talking about healing and then he, he makes this, this pivot or this turn that you're like, this doesn't make sense. How do we go from here to there? How do we talk about pray for people and there's a healing and now it's all of a sudden we're talking about sin and forgiveness. If you confess your sins to one another, if you pray for one another, they can be healed. And this, this tells me number two is not only does God still heal people, but God is concerned about my soul. God is concerned about my soul. Probably, Probably more than anything else, God is concerned with my soul. We spend a lot of time and a lot of finances and a lot of our resources um, taking care of our temple, right? Our bodies, our, our protection, and, and that's good. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. We eat healthy, right? That's awesome, except for on Fridays at family movie night when we eat deep fried Oreos and deep fried corn dogs and french fries. Uh, other than that, we try to eat healthy just that one day, I promise. Um, <laughs> I lied. Uh, but, but here's the deal is, is we try to take care of us. What do we do at home? We lock our doors. We want to protect ourselves. That's wisdom, right? We, we buy life insurance. We buy car insurance. We buy all these insurance to make sure that we are protected. We try to eat healthy. We try to do the right things. We try to exercise. We spend money to surgeries. We're, we're trying to protect ourselves and take care of this temple. But James is saying there's, there's, there's another miracle if you will just see it, and it's in the power of forgiveness, there is a miracle in the power of forgiveness. In Luke chapter 10, verses 19 through 20, 
It says, I have given you the authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. He's saying like, that's great. That's really good. Like, praise the Lord. That's great. That's submit to you. He says, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. You see, the real miracle is there is a book in heaven that you want your name in, right? It's called the Lamb's Book of Life. You know, we talk about all the jokes, like first Peter's at the gates and is your name in the book. There is a book. It's not just a joke. You want your name in that book, right? You, you could be on ESPN. You could win a sixth grade basketball championship. Those are fine, but you want your name in that book, right? It's that book. You, you, like when you stand before Jesus, that's, oh, I got you. I know you. You surrendered your life to me. You have a life. You, you have a relationship with me, and I see your name. That's a miracle. So we praise him for the external. We praise him for what he's doing in our lives, but we rejoice for the eternal, what he wants to do in the future. So lastly, here's the third observation I see, is God wants me to grow in my faith. God wants to grow in faith. He wants to take us along on this journey. He wants us to have faith to believe, as James says, for a healing. He wants to have faith to believe that eternity is real. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. And in there, our scripture in James chapter 5, uh, he goes on to say in verse 17, he says, Elijah was a human being even as we are. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again, he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. So again, why is he going from miracles and and faith for healings, then the forgiveness, and then all of a sudden goes to an Old Testament prophet by the name of Elijah. And he says, Elijah is just like you and me. And you're like, if you read the whole biblical account of Elijah, you go, "Ah, he had a lot of faith. And then he mentored a young man named Elisha, and Elisha did even more miracles. And you're like, I'm not doing any of that. So how is he like you and me? I think you'll catch on to the rest of the story. But you're like, where does, where does, why would he mention this? Why does this come into the text in James all the way from something that happened in 1 Kings? So in the middle, right here in the middle of this, this, this story where he says it didn't rain and then it rained is where there's a great biblical account, you should read it, where Elijah is, is having an issue with King Ahab because King Ahab's a jerk and there's some tension. And so now they're going to they're gonna have this duel. They're going to have this battle. And so King Ahab brings all his prophets out, hundreds of prophets, the prophets of Baal. And he's like, we're going we're gonna to put this altar out in whichever God, God's claim and, 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 and bring down fire and consume this altar. That's who we're going to have faith in. And so the prophets of Baal, they're all out there and they're praying. They're seeking their gods and nothing happens. And Elijah starts talking trash like, like what's going to happen? And nothing happens. And then it's Elijah's turn. Now understand there's a drought. There is no rain. He's prayed. It did not rain. And so Elijah goes and gets water. How many know water in the midst of a drought is a hot commodity? You wouldn't want to waste it. And he takes it and he throws it on the altar, which is made of wood. How many know that wet wood doesn't burn? And so now all of a sudden the altar is full of water. There's rocks all around it. And he begins to call upon God. And God shows up in a mighty way. Not only does he consume the altar, he consumes the water, the rocks, everything there. Like God's like, oh, you... Let me show you just a little bit of what I can do, right? If you don't believe, just again, go to the text, read it. It's a powerful story. So somewhere in the middle, that's that's when that's taking place. And it seems like this is just a cut and dry story. He prayed for no rain and there was no rain. And then he prayed for rain and then it rained. But that account actually looks a little bit more like what our lives probably look like. He's a man just like you and me, and he's on a faith journey. You see, James gives us the end, but he doesn't give us the middle, right? Because there's this moment that we, we realize, how does my faith going to work? How does my faith work? How do I put my faith into motion? How do I, how do I like in this context with Elijah, how, what, what's going to happen along my journey? I want to give you three simple points to your, journey, your faith journey. Here's the first, is faith begins with a word from God. Faith begins from a word from God. The Bible holds thousands of promises, Right? I love, uh, I love uh, the new song, If You Said It, If He Said It, You, can be- you Believe It, right? Uh, it's so powerful. Right? If He said it, you can believe it. There are thousands of promises. Faith comes by hearing and by hearing what? The Word of God. That's in Romans. And so what do we see? We see that God will give us a promise in His Word. He'll give us a promise in our heart. 
See, it was, it was about four years ago where Pastor Angel felt like God spoke to her in the midst of our pain and walking through with our daughter that God was going to heal her one day. And so she sent herself an email four years ago and never opened it. And then just a few months ago, she opened it saying, God, this is what you spoke to me that you would heal her. And here I am opening this email today because you've moved on her behalf. There's a promise. There's a, a word spoken. And God, since you said it, I know you're going to come through. And that's where Elijah is in this, in this biblical text. In 1 Kings 17, 1, it says, Now Elijah the Tishbite from Tishbe in Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years, except at what? At my word. He had a promise from God that at his word, rain would stop and then rain would begin. The text, if you keep reading on in that account, it says that he heard the sound of rain before it ever happened. Hear me on this church. God's promises always come to pass. God's promises always come to pass. Now I know when, you, when, when I said it, you're like, but Pastor Lance, I prayed and God didn't answer. Maybe he did answer. And maybe it wasn't the right timing. Maybe it wasn't according to his will. Maybe it wasn't his purpose. And you're like, yeah, but something, something bad happened and he, he didn't. I, I wonder if one day we'll be, we'll, we'll be in heaven and we'll be like, Jesus, that just doesn't make sense. Why, why did you take this individual from me that I love? Why, why did this happen? And I wonder if our eyes will be open to be able to see what he was able to see in that moment. That an individual would go through pain and trauma and experience horrible, horrible experiences here on earth. And God said, I love him way too much to have him walk through that. I'd rather them be with me than to experience that. And we'll be able to see what he was able to see. And then maybe we'd be going, God, that makes sense. I understand now when your word said your ways are not my ways and your thoughts are not my thoughts. I see now because you had a better plan. You had a better purpose. You had a better understanding. And, and I couldn't see it in the moment, but you could. And thank you, Lord, for having enough wisdom, enough love to do what you did in the way you did it. Isaiah 55, 11, it says, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. We've said it, I've said it. You are not the center of the gospel, Jesus is. This is, this is about what, what's best. What does God want? What are his plans? So we, we see that faith works and it begins from a word of God. But here's where probably the majority of find ourselves today is faith continues when we hold on to what he said. You hold on, you don't quit. You believe in the healing Right? What, what if today you're like, man, I've been praying for 10 years and it hasn't happened. What if today's that day? What if today's that day for you to grasp onto what God has for you? You just hang on. What if today, above all the other days, you've been married and you're like, man, I've, I've been fighting with my spouse for 20 years and they will not change. What if today is a day of restoration? What if today is a day of reconciliation where that relationship is restored? What if today's that day because you've been hanging on? Because you're not, you haven't quit. You haven't given up. What if today's that day where you're like, man, I've been seeking a job and I've been looking for a job and that job just doesn't seem like it's out there. It's not available. And God's like, no, today is that day. Tomorrow, when you wake up, tomorrow could be the breakthrough moment you, you've been waiting for. Just don't give up. Right? He is the anchor truly that we hang on to. Sometimes we feel like we're standing on it and we won't, we won't be moved. And other times we feel like we're at the very end of the rope going, there's nothing left to hang on to. Either way, the anchor's not moving. We may, but the anchor never will because he's the anchor. He's the solid rock. He's the foundation. We got to hold on to him. Keep that grit. Fight the good fight of faith. So let's get back to our story, Elijah. Elijah prayed, and you want to know what happened? It didn't rain. Remember what I said? Like James gives the end, but we don't see the middle. Elijah, yes, eventually, but in the moment when he asked, it didn't happen. He goes up to Mount Carmel, he takes a servant with him, and he tells the servant, he tells the servant listen, this is what I need you to do. I need you to go over, look at the water, I need you to look at the ocean, so make your way around this mountain, right? And, and, and I want you to give a report to me. So Elijah stays on Mount Carmel, and he, the scripture says that he put his head down low, like in between his legs, while he was praying, he was seeking God. God, I know you said you're gonna bring the rain, and I know you're gonna bring it, and sure enough, his, servant, his servant's way over here, and his servant comes back, and he's like, Elijah, I got news. It's not gonna rain. Like I looked on the weather app, 100% chance of sun, right? It's not going to happen. So Elijah says, hey, listen, this is what I need you to do. I need you to go back. And so the servant goes back. 
comes back, Elijah, no rain. Okay, what I need you to do is go back. And so the servant goes back, and he's like, yep, still not there. And he goes back to Elijah, and he's like, Elijah, listen, it's the same report the other two times. There's no rain. And Elijah says, go back. And here's what the scripture says. It says, go and look toward the sea, he told his servant. And he went up and he looked. There is nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. Seven times. Isn't that a persistent faith? Isn't that a faith that says, man, I'm going to keep my head down. I'm going to continue to pray. And I want you to keep going back because I know God is going to move. And so it's an encouragement to us to keep our head down, to keep praying. And then the scripture says the seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. (laughs) For real, Lord. Like, it's going to rain. That's it. Like, that's the cloud. That's, that's, the, that's the rainstorm that's coming because I prayed, you've answered, and here it is. But I love the faith of Elijah. Here's what it says. It says, so Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. As in this cloud is gonna bring so much rain, you won't be able to handle it because it's coming for you, buddy. Now that's faith. That's faith. Sometimes we need to put our face to the ground and then go look again. Did you hear me? Sometimes we, you and I, need to put our face to the ground and go look again. God, but the healing didn't happen. Put your face down, pray, and go look again. But God, my marriage is still struggling. Put your face down, pray for your spouse, and then go look again. And we could keep going all morning long. Keep your face down, pray, and then go look again. Having the faith along the journey to knowing that God is going to show up. I love Galatians 6, 9. It says, let us not grow weary in what? Doing good For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. That's holding on, not letting go, not giving in to what what the enemy has for us, but truly hanging on in this journey of faith. It went from no clouds, seven times no clouds, to a small cloud the size of a man's hand. So what does that tell me? Number three is we need to get used to the understanding that faith goes from a small beginning to a grand finale. Faith goes from a small beginning, right, to a grand finale. Imagine, we just finished 4th of July, right? And many of you probably went and saw fireworks displays, and they were great. Can you imagine if you go to the local fireworks display, and they start with the grand finale? It's like two minutes. You're like, yes! And then from there, they go to one every 30 seconds. How many of you know you ain't staying? You're like, after about four minutes, you're like, time to go, kids. Let's go. But they don't. What do they do? They, they give you, the, usually on the front end, it's like, pop, pop, pop. They give you a little teaser. And then they delay it. And then it's small. And then they begin to build up. And all of a sudden, you're like, oh, it's coming. The grand finale is coming. And we love it. And we get out our phones. And we're like, that's so good. Yeah. Like the whole sky's lit up. It's amazing. But it starts small. And then it ends with the finale. Our faith starts small. But it ends with a finale. The text says in 1 Kings 18, 45 through 46, it says, Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. How did it start? I see, I see, I see a wisp. I see a small hand. Rain's coming. But what did God do? Meanwhile, the sky grew. That that cloud of a hand began to grow. Now the sky is black. The clouds, they're there. The wind is rising. There's heavy rains coming. And then I love what it says. It it says, uh, As the heavy rain came on and Ahab rode off to Jezreel, the power of the Lord came upon Elijah. And tucking in his cloak into his belt, he ran ahead of Ahab all the way to Jezreel. Do you see a miracle in there? Anybody catch what I just, what I was catching? Right? Think about that for a moment. Ahab is on a chariot. Chariots are pulled by two horses. Two horses, Ahab. Let's go. Elijah. I'm going to put my cloak because I got my tunic on. I'm going to tuck it in in my belt. <laughs> Woohoo! Right? He's like the flash. Can you imagine? He's just running past two horses and Ahab, peace out, bro. Like, <laughs> and he gets to the city before Ahab does. Right? He's running that fast. There is a crazy miracle that is taking place. Zechariah 4.10 says, Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see what? The work begin. He doesn't. It doesn't say he rejoices to see it completed. He rejoices when when it begins. He rejoices when it begins. We see the grand finale. God sees the process. Why? Because the process is the point. The process is the point. 
Let, it, let me put it to you in the form of a question. When did Elijah feel the closest to God? Was it when it, his head was down and he was praying and he had the faith to believe that God would make it rain or when he was you know, doing laps around Ahab? I tend to think it would be in the moment where his face was, face was down that he was calling upon God. God, I know you promised this and I know you're going to deliver and so I'm going to keep asking until you show up. Now we, we would probably go, no, nah, it's probably the moment where he was running fast because we could see that and it could be about us. See, us running fast, we could say, do you see how fast I was running? Did you see what I did? Yet the rain had nothing to do with anything Elijah could do. All he could do was pray. He had to trust and have faith that God was going to make it rain. That's the process. Do we trust the process because the process is the point? And the reason the process is the point is because the process is what leads to dependence. The process is what leads to dependence. Those of you who are parents in the room, those of you who've had kids, have, didn't, you didn't just say, great, they're born, now they're 18 and get out. You enjoyed the process, right? You enjoyed the moments of nurturing them. You enjoyed those, you, you, come on, social media, you see it all. You get the reminders every year. Oh, look how cute they are in kindergarten. And then first grade, they're getting on the school bus. And then they get to that point where they don't want their picture taken anymore. And then it, you have to hashtag it, wouldn't smile. Like, you, know, you see what I'm saying? But along that journey, you, you have experiences with your children. And you enjoy the process. And then, they, then hopefully at some point they do become adults who pay their own bills and we're thankful for that process too. But in those moments, we're thankful for the process, the journey that we're on with them. And then every parent said it. You ask every parent in here and we will all say they grow up fast. So enjoy the process. Those of you with toddlers are like, mm-mm, ain't happening. I'm not enjoying the process. Their favorite word is no. When, when do they stop saying that? I don't know. When it happens, I'll let you know. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But you enjoy the process. Before I share this final story, I just want you to know, I, my wife and I love Radiant Life Church. Okay, we love this church. Right? We've given a lot of blood, sweat, and tears you know, for this church. So I, I want to preface that with what I'm about to say. A number of years ago, probably 14, 15 years ago, and this, this doesn't happen often to me, but, but I felt like God gave me a vision. He gave me a dream. And there was this moment where, where I saw myself preach, I thought I saw myself preaching, it, but it felt like there were hundreds of people, thousands of people that were listening. And I was like, well, that's, that's weird, that's odd, right? I'm, a, I'm currently a youth pastor, and I love youth pastoring. We had a group of like 40 kids, it was great, but that wasn't hundreds, right? There was 40, but I kind of saw like more people, and I was like, okay, that's a little bit weird. I, I thought for sure I would just be a youth pastor the rest of my life. I didn't, never thought I'd be a lead pastor, and then there was the moment in my life where my, I would say my burden, you know, what broke my heart began to change. And I began thinking, like, maybe I should become a lead pastor. And so I set out, and, and I did the resume stuff, and they got sent out to different churches. And sure enough, it, I think it was three churches in a row um, that I was the number one candidate. But it, they just didn't feel right. They didn't feel right. It was like, ah, this isn't where God wants us, right? We were in a college town, and I was talking to the, the, the board, and the board said, oh, you were on campus? we don't ever go on campus because of the sin that runs wild there. And I was like, well, that's where I wanna be because those are the people who need Jesus. And they were like, oh, we don't go. And I was like, ah, it's probably not for me then because you may not like me. But I remember the moment feeling discouraged, like, God, I, I thought you gave me a dream. I thought you gave me a dream. I thought that was a vision from you. And it, it, maybe, maybe, maybe I'm just supposed to be a motivational speaker one day somewhere, I don't know. And so there was some discouragement. And then I remember I get, I get this email that says, hey, we sent your resume to Radiant Life Church in Wadsworth. I was like, that's fine. How many know when you're discouraged, the word fine is your only vocabulary you know, right? I was like, it's fine, I, whatever. Probably won't work. And we go through the interview process and things seem to be going well. And then sure enough, it's down to just me and I think another candidate and they bring us in and they interview us and they take us out to eat and it's great. And they walk us through the building. And, and sure enough, I thought for sure, like, God, this can't be. Because I walked through the doors of the church and they had mauve tile. And I was like, Lord, this, is, this was not in my dream. Mauve tile is only in nightmares. It's not in dreams, Lord. So it can't be this place. And sure enough, it's us. And I mean, I remember it was the first Sunday in November, right? I get up and preach and then uh, they take a vote 
And the, and the, the interim pastor comes back and he's like, hey, you, you did really well. You got one no vote. And I said, I want you to find that person. Right? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but, but I was like, do, he's like, do you want it? And I said, yeah. You know, I prayed that it, if, so we're good. We're going to take it. Well, he didn't tell me that when he walked back onto the platform that we were supposed to walk with him. And that was the sign that we would take the job. So he walks out, we're sitting in an office, my, my wife and I and the children, he walks out on the platform, so the whole church thinks I don't want it. And then he comes back in and he's like, I thought you wanted it. I said, I did. He's like, oh, you're supposed to follow me then. I was like, okay, cool. And so we go out onto the platform, everybody starts clapping, everybody's cheering, like, ah! And I'm like, this is it, this is it. Like, this is what God has for me. We're gonna go and everything's gonna be great. And we're just gonna see God move and ah, everything's gonna be wonderful. There will be no problems. Then week two hit. And I, I had a conversation, there was, it was at the time, the staff was myself, uh, Vicki Wilcox, she was part-time administrative assistant, and then we have custodian, Gloria Schilling, right? I won't tell you her age then, but even then she was full of uh, fire. She'd jump up on kitchen cabinets and clean the top of the cabinets uh, and the countertops, just intense. Well, she comes to me in week one, she says, Pastor Lance, I said, yeah. I said, how's everything going? What's your, you know, tell me what you do. How do you keep this big old building clean all by yourself? And she tells me a story how it used to be her and her husband and now it's her and I'm listening. She goes, we do have a problem though. I said, yeah, what's the problem? She goes, we have, we've had this bug infestation in these banners that are hanging in our worship center. Like we can't get rid of them. They're, they're annoying. I've cleaned, I've tried to scrub them, I spray them and the bugs just stay in them and they're, they're gnats and they get on people. And I'm like, well, we can fix that. I said, why don't we take them down? And she goes, could you? I said, sure, why not? And so it was Saturday night, my wife and I went in, we got the ladder out, we took the banners down, we got rid of them because they were infested with bugs. Well, then it's Sunday morning and people walk in and the banners are gone. And there were a few people that didn't like their banners being gone. And they began to complain. They went to Pastor Angel and said, what gives you the right to come into our house and move our furniture? And I was like, y'all don't realize that you hired an exterminator and you have a bug problem. So you get rid of the bugs. You're not mad when you hire an exterminator who does their job. I thought we were doing the right thing. Yet there's people who are frustrated and there's people who are mad. And I'm like, God, that was not my dream. Like, God, I said yes. I said yes to coming in and taking a church of about 60 people. But I saw a lot more than 60 people. God, I took a five-digit pay cut to come here. My, the kids' ministry where they were at, they had tons of friends. The first Sunday we came, the children's ministry doubled when I put my three kids in. We went from three to six. I said, like, God, I, I thought there was a bigger plan to this, to this dream. I'm struggling. And, and every wall in this church has wallpaper. And I don't like wallpaper. So God, why did you call me? Why, did you, why, why is this a thing? Why is there problems? Why is there this frustration? I couldn't see what he could see. I couldn't vision what he visioned. I had the dream and it seemed impossible. It seemed as if that dream would never happen. So what did we do? We sought God, right? We prayed. We said, God, you know you called us. This is a, this is a job. This is, this is a faith journey. There's a process, and we're going we're gonna to be obedient to the process. And we just kept seeking God. And sure enough, then Pastor Angel, she started volunteering right away, week one. Like, we got to Wadsworth. Even before we started the job, she took over as the uh, cheer coordinator for all of Wadsworth Youth Football. Started serving. We started doing concessions, like, as a church. And we started doing some really good things. And, and God began to move. And God began to, to move sovereignly in our lives. And sure enough, we went from, in the first year, we went from 60 to 120. We're like, yes, this is going to be good. Like, this is, yes, yes. And then all of a sudden, someone comes to us. And they're like, hey, we'd like to buy your building. Oh, yeah, what do you want to do with it? We're going to knock it down and put up a get-go gas station and an Aldi grocery store. And I was like, hey, whatever I can do to bless the community, that's what I'm here for, right? <laughs> and we had a business meeting. And Mary Jo Miller, who's no longer with us, she, she grabs the microphone and she speaks so softly. And she says, we've had the best location for 60 years and it hasn't helped us. I say we sell. Yep. She said it. We believed it. We sold the building. We had enough money to be able to, to build this building. 
And then over time, what do we see God do? Show up in marvelous ways. Did you know that last year, missions alone, we gave more to missions last year than our entire budget 10 years ago? Right, than our entire budget, yeah. But I couldn't see it. In the first 18 months, I officiated 23 funerals. The busiest ministry in our church was those who were cooking meals for all the funerals. And I was like, God, I don't know if you realize it, but, but that's called subtraction. That's not multiplication. I had a dream of hundreds, and yet we're decreasing. And yet God's been faithful along the entire process. And there are many in this room, as I look out, who were there 10 years ago, who voted yes. If you were the one who voted no, I want you to know I forgive you. <laughs> but there was a process. And Tina has hung on. And Hal has hung on. And Glenn and Julie have hung on. And May's hung on. And Bob and Mary have hung on. And Marnie, Marnie was our, our nursery coordinator. I told you the story where there would be weeks where she would come back into the worship center after, while service was happening. And I was like, Marnie, who's watching the kids? She's like, there aren't any. Now we have rooms, a whole wing for all of the kids to be watched. We have to have four people every Sunday watch kids because there's so many kids. And I can't wait to where we have to have eight people watching all the kids and 10 people watching all the kids because I had a dream and I felt like God, and, it, and all of a sudden, where am I? Right before COVID, we took a picture of the worship center. The chairs were definitely much, you didn't have the space you had, your knees hit the chair in front of you and there wasn't an empty seat. We had, we had cars parked in the grass and we had launched our second campus and God was moving. And I was like, God, that dream, dream that you gave me is becoming a reality. You're moving, and I can't thank you enough, but I couldn't see it then. But there was a process to the journey. There was a promise, there was the process, and God moved. And then there's the payoff, because here we are. So this morning, here's how we're going to close out our service. You say, hey, we didn't have any worship. I want to give you an opportunity to pray. And so I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask for, for those of you, the scripture says call on the elders of the church. So if you served on the board in the past or you serve currently on the board, I'm just going to ask you to do me a favor and make, if you serve and your spouse, if you could just make your way down front and just turn around and face the congregation. If that's you this morning, I know a lot we're in the first service, but if you're here, just make your way down front. Any staff, we'd love to have you join us as well. Um, because it does say if anyone among you is sick, call on the elders. And so we want to pray for you. Here's the deal. Ain't nobody, ain't nobody doing anything crazy. We just want to pray. That's it. Miracles happen because God moves, not because it's something that we, we orchestrate. It's something that he does. And so we simply want to pray for you this morning. So we're going to pray. The second thing is, this is what we're going to do. We're going to worship and we're going to listen to the promise. Because God has a promise for each and every one of you in here. And maybe you're hanging on to it already. But maybe there's something in his word or something that he's gonna drop into your heart. He's just gonna give you that promise that, that your marriage is gonna be restored. He's gonna give you that promise that, that healing is gonna happen. He's gonna give you that promise that, that you're gonna be okay. So you're gonna listen to the promise and you're gonna worship. And then you're gonna lift your voice. And if you feel comfortable, I'm gonna challenge you to lift your hands as a sign of surrender. You're gonna lift your voice to the Lord and say, God, I thank you for the process, even though it doesn't feel good, that there is pain in this process. I know that there is also provision in the process, that you are gonna come through and I will lift my hands and I will lift my voice as a song of praise to you because I know that you are constantly moving for the good of those that love you and I love you and so I wanna let it be known. So we'll worship him for the process. And then we're gonna close celebrating because there's a payoff, there's a victory. You can have victory today. You can live and walk in victory today because there is a payoff. One day it will be eternity, but now, even now, you can walk in freedom. You can live in freedom because of what Christ has ultimately done for you. So before, before we jump into this, what I need you to do. Bobby, can you come? Can I borrow, live? Somebody can borrow your microphone. So last week, you know, here at Rain Life Church, we know that God speaks to people and we want people to be able to hear it. And so there is a process to that. If God speaks, you, 
You come to one of myself or anybody on staff and just say, I believe the Lord wants to encourage us and we want the body to be encouraged. And so last week she said, I believe this is what the Lord is telling me. And I said, I believe that to be true. But I think it's for next week. She just hears from the Lord early. And so I want you to hear this before we jump into prayer. Pastor Matt, I really appreciate you. You have a way of choosing songs that just, just hit where we're at. And last week was one of those weeks where the Lord was just taking every song that we sang and just connecting them. And that's what Holy Spirit was doing, and that's what he's still doing today. But I can't tell you the names of the songs, sorry. But um, one of them had to do with faith. I'm, I'm sorry, we're going to start with hope. One of the first songs we sang had to do with hope. And then the next one after that had to do with faith. And then it talked about um, the Lord's majesty or his, something about the majestic. And what he was doing was how we move into faith is starting out with hope. But hope doesn't accomplish the thing that we're asking and believing for. It has to connect with faith. And the way it connects with faith is through our worship and just magnifying God because of who he is, because of what he's able to do. So he wants us to celebrate this morning because that's how our faith grows. That's how it increases. I bet if you ask Bree, she can tell you, because I've seen her. I, I've seen her move into faith because of her worship. And that's where we see victory. Amen. Come on, put your hands together for the Lord this morning. Hope, right? Listen, 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 listen. Small beginning, grand finale. Hope, small beginning, his majesty, his glory in, our, in worship while we lift up our hands and lift up our voices. What? Grand finale. We see God do things that only God can do. So we're going to pray. We're going to pray. Then we're going to worship in the process knowing that he's moving and then we're going we're gonna to understand that there's a payoff and we're going to leave this place in victory so all over this place I'm going to encourage you would you stand to your feet this morning Father I pray that you begin to move in hearts and move in lives and I pray that you would do what only you can do I pray that you would stir up in, in our hearts today, God, a passion, a drive for you. Lord, as your word, as, as we sing this song, Lord, send revival. Revive, revival is not, is not started because the church does something. It, started, it starts because your people have a passion for you. So put in us a passion. Stir up something deep inside of us this morning, we pray, Lord. That we would, we would come to this place full of prayer, full of understanding that you are moving and you are doing all things right through the process trusting you with your promise and understanding there's a payoff. If you need prayer this morning, I'm just encourage you to get up out of your seat, walk down front, and let's just pray together. For those of you who are like, I'm good, would you just lift your hands all over this place? Would you make this your prayer? Lord, send revival.